And so we've been talking about finding your place. We first established that what's our first calling before we're called to go and do? What's the first thing? We're called to him first. Jesus calls us to him first. Jesus did that with with his disciples before he sent them out two by two. It says that he called the 12 to himself. Amen. And you and I have been called to Jesus first. Before we're supposed to do anything, before anything else, nothing else takes the priority of coming to Jesus, being in the presence of Jesus, sitting at the feet of Jesus. This is the one thing Jesus told this to Mary and Martha. He said, one thing is needed. One thing is needed. Well, I need to go and do this for God. No, you. one thing is needed. What you think and what you feel doesn't supersede what Jesus said. I feel like I need to go do this. Well, let's change our feelings. The reality of it is one thing is needed, and that's to sit at the feet of Jesus. That's the one thing that's needed. Amen? Because we're not out here just trying to multiply ourselves in people and with people. We're trying to multiply Jesus. (laughs) Amen? And the only way to do that is for us to sit at the feet of Jesus, receive something from Him, and then go give it to everybody else. Amen. And so we established that part, and that's the most important thing, and it always will be the most important thing, is for you to sit at the feet of Jesus. But then we also found out that everybody does have a specific place, that there is a place that God wants to plant you in. And wherever He plants you, that's where we want to be. We don't want to be where I plant me. I don't want to be where I put myself, because then I'm the source of the fruit. Amen. I don't want to be the source of bearing fruit in my life. Amen. I need something more than that. I need Jesus. <laughs> I need his grace, his anointing, his blessing and favor on my life so that my fruit is a representation of him and not just a representation of myself. Amen. And so let's go over to our golden text. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 12. We're going to read just a couple of verses here. And Y'all just bear with me tonight may be a little bit slower, a little bit more foundational because there's, there's somewhere the, the Lord really wants to go and there's something the Lord shared with me um, last week and I thought it was for tonight, but we need to set something up for it first. Amen. So we're going to take it step by step. Y'all okay with that? Yeah. All right. So we don't want to skip something. We want to make sure that we have a full understanding and revelation. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 12. In verse number 14, it says, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, Because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, Because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them, as He chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So we all have our place. We all have a specific calling from God. Amen. And it's as He chose. And this is something that we've got to retrain and renew our mind to the thinking that, well, you can just do anything. And a lot of parents say that to their kids, that you can do anything you want to do. You can do anything you set your mind to do. Not as a believer. That's not the case. That's That's not the case at all. We can do anything, and there's the blessing of God that's upon your life to do the thing that He has planned and prepared for you. Amen? And as as Jesus followers, because that's what we are, as Christians, we follow Jesus, we want to do what he wants. And if we have a, sometimes, and I, I, we've, I think we've all been in that place where the Lord may prompt you or, or lead you to do something and your flesh doesn't want to do it. <laughs> Maybe your soul is a little bit slow in catching up to your spirit that's so willing to do it. Yeah. But the Bible says, and this is the good part in Philippians chapter 2, it says that it's the Lord who, who works in us both to will and to do. So he'll help you do it, but he'll also help you want to do it. Amen. 
He'll help bring that slow mind sometimes and that slow physical body, the natural part of you that's so sluggish to yield to him, to obey to him. He'll help you get there. Praise God. And he sent the Holy Spirit, the helper, to live and dwell on the inside of us to help us, to help us get where we want to go. And I think that's a big question that a lot of people have. And really what we're doing in this series, we're trying to answer a lot of these questions, right? Does God, is there a place for me? Yes, emphatically, yes. But then I think a follow-up question is, well, where is it, (laughs) right? What is it that God wants me to do? And how do I know if I'm doing that? How do I know if I'm on the right path? How do I know if I'm doing the right thing? There seems to be no physical evidence that I'm doing the right thing. I really don't know what's going on. But we've got to stop looking in the natural for confirmation and affirmation. Because God's leading us, how? By our spirit, right? The book of Romans, I believe it's in chapter 8, it says that the Holy Spirit bears witness with your spirit that you are a child of God. So he's not necessarily trying to communicate with you in the natural. Amen? That doesn't mean that he won't. That doesn't mean that he doesn't. But he's primarily going to communicate with you in your spirit. It's that still small voice. It's that Holy Spirit on the inside of you that's going to bear witness with your spirit through peace. That you're doing the right thing. You're on the right path. You're going to the right place. And it's that peace that passes understanding because there's, that's so key and so important in following the plan and the path of God for your life. Sometimes it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Why would I do this? This doesn't really make any sense to me. But look for peace. Now listen, here's the important part. Don't create peace. Here's what I mean by that. Because you made a decision that there's no more pressure, I don't have to decide. So there's, it, it, it's, it's, it's a pseudo, it's a fake peace. Because you made a decision, there's peace that's present because there's no more decision to be made. But that doesn't mean it was the right decision. Is there peace on the inside? If you, if you strip away, you take away everything natural about your decision, is there still peace right. on the inside, in your heart? And there's a lot of people who question, well, how do I know if I'm, I don't even know how to be led by the Spirit of God. I don't even know how to be led by the Holy Ghost. But listen, you absolutely do. Don't accept that lie from the devil. That's deception. That's from the enemy. That's not the Lord talking to you. That's just the enemy trying to deceive you that you don't know his voice. But John chapter 10, it tells us Jesus is talking. He says, my sheep know my voice. Again, don't let your feelings, they're not going to supersede what Jesus said. Jesus said that you know his voice. So what is it? Do we know his voice or not? We do. And if we're willing to make faith confessions about our physical body, right? When when, when there's a, a lying symptom, an attack on your body, something that's not supposed to be there, what's the first thing we do? We start confessing the word that I am healed. That by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed. He himself took my infirmities and bore my sicknesses on the cross. Amen. Amen. We, we start declaring all these things. Why can't we make faith confessions saying, I hear the voice of God clearly. I always know what to do. Right. You want to know why most people don't know what to do? Is because that's what they confess day and night. That's right. I don't know what to do. I don't know what I'm going to do. Yep. I have no idea what I'm doing. I have no idea what's going to happen. I don't know. What, I don't know. But the, Jesus said that he was going to send the Holy Spirit to show you things to come. Didn't Jesus say this? And listen, I can pinpoint in every believer's life that at least at one point in time in your life, if you're a believer, if you accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can pinpoint at least one time where you were led by the Spirit of God. Maybe you didn't know it, but you were because you accepted Him. That was the Holy Spirit on the inside leading you to salvation. That was a leading of the Spirit of God. That was a prompting on the inside. And so you just take it back to that, right? The Bible talks about in, in the book of Colossians that, that as you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. So we, were receive, we received Him with that still small prompting on the inside. Everybody, you can pinpoint when you got born again. 
there was something in your heart. There was a stirring in your heart to receive Jesus. That's the Holy Spirit helping you, leading you to salvation. And the Lord's going to do the same thing for you now. The Holy Spirit is there to lead you, to guide you, to direct you, to instruct you, yeah? To teach you. He's not there to just always look at you and say, no, you're not doing anything right. No, you're not quite making it. He's there to instruct you and teach you through grace and love to get you where you need to be. Amen. 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 And I'm so thankful for it. So, first of all, before we, we, you know, we've, we've established that there is a place for you. But now, for just a moment, I want to talk about how do you know that you're going down the right path? How do you know that you're in the right place or at least headed there? And sometimes what we want is we want the whole picture, right? We want the whole thing. I want to know step 802 when I'm on step six. And that's not how the Lord works. Why? Because it would blow your mind. (laughs) You would feel so overwhelmed. There would be so much more room for anxiety and fear, even more than there already is. The Lord leads you step by step. That's why it's called a walk of faith. Mm -hmm. We just quoted it out of Colossians. As you have received Christ Jesus, so walk in Him. And I believe it was a couple of uh, messages ago we we talked about uh, Enoch, right? How we really don't know a whole lot about him. We really don't know a whole lot about his life. I think there's something like six or seven verses in the entire Bible, Old Testament and New, that even reference him. It's crazy. We know who his dad was. We know who his son was. And, you know, he's he's in uh, Hebrews chapter 11, the Hall of Fame of Faith. And we know that Enoch just was not, right? That the Lord just took him and Enoch just was not there, right? We know that. Then the only other thing we know about him is that he, he took a walk with God for 300 years. It says, Enoch walked with God for 300 years. That's it. That's all we know. And this is how the Lord dealt with people throughout all Scripture. Think about when Jesus called his disciples, when he first met his disciples. How crazy that those interactions really were. Like, for us, it's like, well, we know what happened with them. Like, it totally makes sense. Like, why would they not follow Jesus? But think about what happened. (laughs) Like when Jesus met uh, John and his brother James, right? And they're out fishing with their dad and he's like, leave it all and come follow me. And they're like, "Uh, okay, bye dad. (laughs) And they just went and left everything and followed him. Same with all of his disciples. They didn't know him. (laughs) But I guarantee you that there was some kind of prompting that was like, hey, (laughs) we should follow this dude. This seems like a good thing to do. Yeah? And so, but over and over again in Scripture, we can go back to the Old Testament with Abram. When God was calling him out of his dad's, out of his parents' house, and he was like 70 years old, it was definitely time to move out of mom and dad's house. It was well past time to go out and let's make some adventures of your own at 70. It's probably time to hit the road. And so, but the Lord called him, but this is how the Lord called him. It's Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. You can go look at it for yourself. Just in chapter 12, verse 1, it says, I will come with me. I will take you to a land. I'll come to a land that I will show you. And the Lord brought, stuck that out to me and he said, notice I didn't tell him where he was even going. He said, come to a land that I will show you. Yeah, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred. Leave everything. Leave your family. Leave your friends. Leave where you've been for 70 years. And your father's house to the land that I will show you. Now, why didn't God spell it out for him and say, now here's what's going to happen. You're going to leave your father's house. You're going to leave all this, but... Here's where you're going. It's going to be the land of Canaan, the land that flows with milk and honey. This is where I'm taking you. And you're going to be so blessed, blessed beyond all that you've ever imagined. Why didn't God say that? God gave him a step. God gave him a step, a singular step. And when Abram took that, which he did, right? He did take that next step. 
Yeah. And we know the rest of the story and it's great and it's wonderful. But you think about in that moment, and of course in verse 2, he says that I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you, make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you and him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. In verse number 4 it says, so Abram went. (laughs) That was all the information that Abram had. That God said, leave what you're comfortable with. Leave your place of comfort to a place I'm not even telling you where yet. But it's going to be good. It's going to be a great thing, but you got to leave that first. And a lot of times before you're able to come to a door that's opened, you got, God kind of exits you from wherever you were. And we're hesitant in those transitions because it's, 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 it's different. It's not the normal for me. So I don't, this is not comfortable for me. My flesh likes this because this is comfortable. My flesh enjoys this because I know this. There's, you as believers, we as believers can be bold and confident beyond uncertainty. Let me tell you what I mean by that. Yes, there's uncertainty. For Abram, I'm sure there was a lot of uncertainty. Well, what does that even look like? (laughs) Where am I even going? (laughs) There's a lot of questions I'm sure he had and a lot of room for hesitation, but he was still bold and confident, not because of, of, of him becoming a great nation of the promise, but because of the one who promised it. That's what, that's what's so convincing for you and I, that we can become like Abraham, fully persuaded that he who promised is faithful. And he is able to do it. And so when God calls you out of something, it's not that he's saying, leave everything that you love. I'm taking you to a place that you're going to prosper and be fulfilled. It's uncomfortable on your flesh to leave what you're familiar with, but I can promise you it's going to be better. And this happened all throughout scripture. And over and over again, we see that with Abram and his life. Whenever God said something, he was just like, okay, (laughs) yeah. Especially when he came to him and said, okay, circumcise yourself and circumcise all of your male servants. And he was like, okay. And it says the same day. (laughs) He wasted no time with things that were extremely uncomfortable. (laughs) Yeah? (laughs) Crazy, right? But he just said, okay. Yes, that sounds great. But I also love his response because, you know, and Abram is, or Abraham is known as the father of faith, right? That he's an example that Paul used in the book of Romans as an example for us to follow in faith and trust in God and confidence in him and belief in him. And nowhere did he say, okay, but first God, you do this for me. You show me this, give me a sign. We as New Testament believers have to stop seeking signs. Don't follow signs. The Bible says that signs and wonders will follow him that believes. Him that believes are not following signs and wonders. And when you get these, this thing backwards and you get it twisted, this is how you end up in a ditch. Yep. And this is how you end up confused. Yep. Well, I thought, you know, this was great over here for a minute. No, all that is is, the, well, the grass is greener over there. So I want to go over there. But you find out that the grass is not necessarily greener over there. <laughs> right? The grass is only going to be green for you where God plants you. It's never going to be green anywhere else. It will never, you will never, listen, I love you, but here's the truth about it. You will never thrive and flourish in any place that you plant yourself. Never. It'll never happen. And I love Abram's response to God. It just said, so Abram went. He just, sure, yeah. Yep, sounds great. That's exciting. I'm out of here. And he left. And it's amazing to me 
And I'm not saying Abraham, Abram and Abraham got everything right. Because we definitely know he didn't. <laughs> there were several times and several instances where he missed it. Yeah. But this was, this was a reoccurring thing with Abram and Abraham. That When God said something, God would just declare something over him, say something, give him direction. And he's like, yep, sure, that's great. We're doing it now. You know, this happened uh, another time in the Old Testament <clears throat> with the prophet Samuel. Y'all remember this? After, after God told him that Saul was no longer going to be king, that I'm going to anoint a new king of Israel. And here's the word that, that, that God gave to Samuel. He said, go to the house of Jesse, and among one of his sons will be the new king. Why didn't he just tell Samuel, go to Jesse's house. He's got his youngest boy named David. He's going to be out in the field. Go get him there and anoint him to be king. Why didn't God do it that way? God wants your trust. God is always, Jesus did this countless times throughout his ministry. Go study the gospel of John sometime and see how many times it says, and Jesus said this, I said this so you would believe. I did this so you would believe. I did this so you would be persuaded that I am the Messiah. How many times, go back and look at it. Jesus was constantly trying to solicit faith and trust from you. Faith and trust from them. And he's still doing the same thing today. There's those still small leadings that seem so insignificant. Because, well, this is just such a small step. But this step has to come before that one. There's something the Lord's preparing in you there's something the Lord is preparing you for that requires this step that seems insignificant. It seems hidden. Amen. But I want to encourage you, follow those still promptings, those still small promptings, those little leadings that seem in your mind like it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's no big deal. But as you, as you do that, man, that's how you grow. That's where growth is taking place. Because there's growth. Man, we're, you know, we're, we're, we may not be on step 806, but we're, now we're on step 245. We're growing. We're, we're going towards, and I'm not saying that the plan of God is 800 steps. Don't, let's not get formulas here, okay? But here's, here's what I am saying. Whatever the Lord is leading you to, there will be steps before that. And some of them seem insignificant. Some of them seem small and of no consequence. But I can, I can promise you, I can guarantee you, they're not. They matter. These little things matter. Let's take Jesus, for example. We love Jesus, don't we? Yeah. We love our Jesus. Yeah. And his life is our example. Amen. Praise God. But when Jesus was born... We know a lot about his birth, and you know, it's middle of October. Christmas is coming. Yes. Some of us have started listening to Christmas music already because I love Christmas music. <laughs> I love Christmas music. It's, it's a wonderful time. It's, anyway, it's my favorite season of the year. So, but we know a lot about the birth of Jesus. There, we, there's always a big celebration. There's always a big to do, and rightfully so. There should be. That's why and how I can justify listening to Christmas music now. I'm just getting a jump start on celebrating Jesus' birth. Anyway. <laughs> but there's, a, there's a big to do. We know a lot about it. The Bible says a lot about it. There are prophecies for hundreds of years before it ever happened. Big deal. And then we know a little bit about Jesus as a, as, a, as, a, as a small child, this much. We know this much about his childhood, right? How he went to the temple <laughs> with his parents and they left him there, <laughs> right? And this is Luke chapter 2. They left him there and they, um, Joseph looked at Mary and said, I thought you had him. Mary said, I thought you had him. Nobody had him, so they had to double back and go get him. And when they found him, they found him teaching the, 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 the teachers of the law. Jesus was teaching and opening revelation for them. And he said, didn't you know I'd be about my father's business? And then from there, he, I think he was 12 years old. 
if, if, if I'm not mistaken. Jesus was 12 at that point in time. And then guess what? We know nothing until he's 30. Nothing. So what happened for 18 years? What happened? And we can sit here and speculate, which a lot of people do, speculate about what happened, but the Bible actually tells us what happened. Tells us all we need to know about it anyway. It's Luke chapter 2, verse 52. It says, And Jesus grew in wisdom, in stature. That word stature is not just height. I'm sure Jesus did grow in height, but it wasn't just height. That word stature means maturity. Jesus grew in wisdom, in maturity, and he grew in favor with God and with man. Now that word favor is the Greek word charis. So Jesus grew in grace. Jesus grew in grace. That's what he did for 18 years. He grew in his grace. He grew in his calling. Jesus allowed the, uh, God and allowed the Holy Ghost to prepare him before he ever stepped out in ministry at age 30. That doesn't mean that Jesus was outperforming miracles. We know that's not the case because the Bible clearly says in Jesus' first miracle was turning the water into wine, right? right? So let's not speculate about, well, Jesus was healing the birds and he was doing this and none of that happened. He wasn't multiplying goldfish in children's church. Right. Wasn't happening, okay? But Jesus was growing in revelation, right. in wisdom, in maturity. Why? So that when the time came for him to take step 805, Jesus had already taken the 804 before that. And the same for you and I. We're going to grow in grace, grow in, in, in the callings and the anointings and the things. We're going to grow in revelation. We're going to grow in wisdom. We're going to grow in maturity by following and being quick to obey those small, still promptings, those little leadings from the Holy Ghost on the inside. And sometimes those things seem very insignificant in the moment and then it becomes the biggest deal later. Let me give you an example. Several years ago, um, well, I guess this was the fall of 2013. So nine years ago. Uh, the drummer here at the church was moving uh, to go to school and so we didn't have a drummer. Now, I didn't play drums. As a child, I'd never, I never had professional help. <laughs> and back then, you could tell. It was very, very evident that Jonathan did not grow up playing drums. But Daniel, and I believe it was absolutely a leading from the Lord, pushed me, <laughs> quite physically pushed me, into playing drums here at the church. And I don't know that he knew the full extent of it, and we're going to explain that in just a moment, but in that moment... That was a defining moment for me to say yes or to say no. And here's why that was so important. Now, when I started playing, it was awful. Listen, there, was, <laughs> there were times that sticks flew out of my hand and went who knows where and, and, and sticks broke and hit me in the face. I'm telling you, things happened, weird things happened. I had no idea what I was doing. And so there were times, that, <laughs> this one time I was playing on a Sunday morning and I hit my cymbal, and I didn't know what I was doing, so I hit it, and it fell over. But when it did, it cut through all the power cables that were sitting there, and the song was still going. I just left it, and I started smelling something weird. And I was like, something's burning. It was, it was actually the, the uh, power cable that were all the lights in my drums, and actually Daniel's amp that he used at the time. And his guitar just stopped working because Jonathan had cut the cable with his cymbal. <laughs> had no idea what the heck I was doing. Not, the, not even a small clue. But I kept at it, kept at it, kept practicing, and the Lord helped me, and I'm decent at playing drums now. But here's why that's important. Because I went to Guitar Center, this is probably a year after I had been playing, and I was going to buy my own drum set. And this was a big deal. It's actually, it's the one that's sitting over there. Um, I was going to buy the drum, this drum set. It was really nice. It was, su sounded super good, had really good tones. But I didn't know what I was looking for. I had no idea what I was looking for. But I met this guy at Guitar Center. 
And in the moment, I just struck up a conversation and started talking to him and asked his opinion. And I told him, I said, it's for a church. It's for praise and worship. What would you recommend? And he told me, he helped me out. He was a really nice guy. I ended up getting his phone number um, at the end because I found out that he played for a church here in town. And we ended up talking. We became really, really, really good friends. Uh, we hung out for years, took vacations together. We were really good buddies. And then probably, let's see, it would have been four years later. So four years of me hanging out with him, being friends with him. I met his sister, Katie. Didn't know she existed. Didn't know she was around. Never heard of her. <laughs> but then heard of her, met her, and was very interested <laughs> really quickly. Who is your sister? She looks fantastic. I need to know her. I need to know her a lot better now. And so, but anyway, his name is Alex, and I met him at Guitar Center. And listen, I'm not saying that I would have never met Katie if I wouldn't have done, but listen, you can clearly see this path that started in 2013 of just playing drums, something that seemed really insignificant in the moment, like this really doesn't matter, the church needs a drummer, so I guess so. But this little thing, seemingly insignificant, is what led me to meeting my wonderful wife. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And that seems, you know, a little ridiculous to a lot of people, but it's that little step that happened in 2013 that caused me to meet my wife in 2017. And so those small promptings, those little leadings that are from the Holy Ghost, don't discount those. And we don't even want to say that they're insignificant. They may seem insignificant, but I guarantee you they are not. And I've done other things that were not from the Lord, that were from me, and missed it. And there were leadings that were trying to get me out of it. And I can tell you what, those are also pretty significant down the road because there's a lot of cleanup. That takes place because you made some mistakes. Now, there's mercy, there's grace, and the Holy Ghost is still there. But what I want to encourage you in is those little leadings, those little things that seem small now. They're not small. It's the Lord leading you. Listen, that's what it, that's what it says. Um, it says in the Old Testament, it says that the steps of the righteous are ordered of the Lord. Your steps, your steps... There's no such thing as a leap of faith. It's steps of faith. That's right. We take steps of faith. It's these, man, these things that the Lord's leading you to do. And this takes place in your healing as well. Healing of your physical body. Maybe you've been standing on the word for something. The Lord will give you instruction and leadings and wisdom on what to do. Maybe the step is not to throw out your medicine. Right. Don't assume that's what, that's, well, that's how God led them. You want to know how I thought I was going to meet my wife? Going to Bible school. That's what I had, I had pictured for myself. I'm going to go to Bible school. That's where I'm going to meet my wife. You know who I didn't meet at Bible school? My wife. That's right. Didn't happen. And so don't think that because th and that was how my parents met. Pastor shared that on Sunday. They met at Bible school. At the exact Bible school I went to. I was like, well, odds are good. You know, worked for dad. Probably worked for me too. <laughs> but if it's not the Lord, it's not right. That's right. If it's you, it ain't the right thing. It's all a matter of you being led by the Holy Ghost for yourself. Yeah. Not taking what somebody else did, what somebody else accomplished, and well, they took these five steps, and I can take those five steps, and it should be the same. That ain't it. That ain't it. This is why it's so important that you hear from him, not from them. It's, you can get encouraged by people. And listen, we can hear people's testimonies and, and them giving God glory and, and thanksgiving for what God's done in them and through them. We should be sharing that to stir each other up. But we shouldn't be sharing that and taking it as, well, that's formula. They did that, so I got to do that. 
Everybody's story is different. Yeah. That's right. And what the Lord's leading you to do is different than what He's leading her to do and him to do. Right. It's going to be different. I can tell you for sure, it's all of them, everybody, it's going to require faith. Yep. It's like a cookie, right? Y'all like cookies? Yes. I like cookies. Cookies are fantastic. There are certain ingredients in every cookie to make it a cookie. <laughs> But you can make snickerdoodle, you can make chocolate chip, you can make, pe- you can make infinite amount of cookies, but there's, there's these base ingredients that every cookie will require. And it's the same way. You may be a snickerdoodle, and I may be a peanut butter cookie, and that's okay. But if you try to mimic what I'm doing, you're not going to be a snickerdoodle. <laughs> you're going to be a copy of a peanut butter cookie, (laughs) not the original. And this is where comparison comes in because you're trying to compare a peanut butter cookie to a snickerdoodle cookie and you don't understand why they're not matching up because they're not the same. (laughs) They're not the same. Get rid of the comparison. Stop playing the comparison game. Stop it. The Apostle Paul talks about that to the Corinthian church. I think it's the message uh, version that says, by comparing yourself among yourself, you're missing the point. I'm not comparing myself because, listen, either way, it's self-centered. Because either I'm comparing myself to someone who's better than me, who has something that I want and desire in my life, and I'm like, I won't be fulfilled, I won't be complete until that. Or I'm comparing myself to someone who I view as behind me. Well, at least I'm better than they are, not where they are. Either way, it's self-centered and prideful. Either way, either way, the Lord doesn't like it. Amen. So I want to encourage you, these little leadings that seem insignificant, they're not. They're very vitally important to you fulfilling the plan of God and you reaching your God-given destiny. And everybody has that. Everybody has a plan of God on their life, a call of God on their life. Now listen, don't get confused that every single person is supposed to be up on a platform. Now that ain't it. Because not everybody is supposed to be up on the platform. There are people who are called to do that and they should flourish and thrive in that. But there are people who are called to be dentists. There are people who are called to be lawyers and doctors and businessmen and businesswomen and entrepreneurs. God calls people to do that. God has a calling for you. Whatever that is, that's your place. And follow those leadings there. Amen. So to answer the question, how do you know that you're on the right path? That you're, that you're, you're in your place? It's very simple. And I'm not trying to insult your intelligence and I'm not trying to oversimplify it. But let's just, let's strip down all the fluff, boil it down. What actually is, how do we know that? Where's the confidence from? And it's peace. It's peace. Do I have a peace about this? And that's, boil it all down. That's what it is, man. Do I have a peace about this? And, you know, we, we, we discussed this just, just for a moment. But with um, Jesse, right, we, or with, with the prophet Samuel going to Jesse's house, right? And he got in there and he, he asked Jesse, he said, where are your sons? And he brought him all of his sons except for David, right? And they all came in one by one. And Samuel was like, mm, nope, that one's not it. Nope, that one's not it. And the, the Lord through Samuel went through every single one of them and none of them were right. You want to know a big difference in why that is? Because, you know, of course we know the the, the story that he anointed David to be king of Israel, the next king of Israel. And then you fast forward just a little bit, just a little bit, and you see Goliath and all of David's brothers are hiding like cowards behind a rock. None of them remembered their relationship and covenant with God. David did. So all those little things that God was leading David to do, those seemingly insignificant small things like him being a shepherd, 
I'm sure he was belittled by his family a lot. Yep. Clearly, he wasn't even invited. Jesse forgot about him. He said, oh yeah, well, I do have one out there. I don't think you want to see him though. And clearly his brothers belittled him, right? When he got to uh, the, the battle with Goliath is talking, they tried to belittle and, and make David feel small, which didn't work. That's right. <laughs> Because the Bible says that David was a man after God's own heart. You know where that was built? Not in the palace. It was built in the shepherds, while he was shepherding the sheep in the fields. And David had the confidence to face Goliath with his covenant and with God because he had already faced the lion and the bear. I did that. This is nothing. So he remembered the faithfulness of God out in the field when there really weren't a whole lot of stakes. Here, the stakes are massive against Goliath, right? This is everything. This is a big deal. But David walked out there in peace and confidence. It says David ran to the battle. He wasn't afraid because he knew his covenant with God. Amen? Are you all with me? All right, we're going to, I'm going to introduce an idea to you and then we'll have to stop it and we'll talk about it in a couple weeks. (laughs) So we've established the fact, number one, that our first calling is to Jesus. Important. We've established the fact that everybody has a place and it says God chooses. It says he chose, not us. And we have a willing spirit and we yield to him and we surrender to him happily and joyfully. Amen? Amen. Whatever he wants, not what I want, whatever he wants. We've established that. Now we've just answered the question is, uh, how do I find my place and how do I know if I'm there, right? If you have additional questions, come talk to me. (laughs) But the next thing is, what is it that when you know where your place is, maybe you know exactly what it is, where it is, what is it that stops people from going there. And there's three things, and I'm going I'm to share with you these three things, and then we'll expound on them in a couple of weeks. Y'all ready? Three things that the Lord gave to me that people, let's call it for what it is, excuses or reasons, whatever you want to say, for not going after what the Lord has put on their heart. Number one is fear of the future. I don't know how it's going to work. What if I fall on my face? Fear of the future. Number two is failures of the past. I've made a lot of mistakes here. I've messed up a lot. And there's, there's that condemnation that comes in to try to hammer you back down to prevent you from getting up and going after what he's called you to do. And those failures of the past, man, they rush through. And we're going to talk about that And the third thing is your feelings of the present. So fear of the future, failures of the past, feelings of the present. What do I mean by by feelings of the present? You either are attached so much to the comfort that is now. This is is the comfort that is what I've built in this life or or the comfort of this is where God called me 20 years ago. And there's, there's comfort there and that's fine. I'm not saying anything against that. But maybe the Lord's leading you somewhere else to do something else. And that's okay. But don't be so attached to comfort that you don't follow Him in faith. Or maybe your feelings of the present is that you're unqualified. What do I have to offer? Who am I? What do I have to give Why would God want me there? I can think of a billion other people that would fit better there than me. I just feel so unqualified. And we're not even realizing and remembering that it's God's grace that equips and empowers you to do that thing. And we're going to deal with all of those things together. Amen? We're going to handle all of those things because, listen... 
God, th- there is no time to waste anymore. We can't just sit here wasting time. Nope. There's a mission that the body of Christ needs to take a little bit more seriously than we have. That there's people who don't just need to hear Jesus died for your sins. Yes, he does. But Jesus rose from the dead, gave you an inheritance. And now there is no sin issue in your life anymore. The true full gospel of Jesus Christ needs to be shared with people. And it's not only, listen, not only going to be shared from the platform. Doesn't mean it's not. It will be shared from the platform. And I believe in these last days that people will flood to churches to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. People, it, it's happened before, and it's, it's, it's ignorant to say it's not going to happen now. Well, the world's changed. The world has changed, but the gospel has not. And the gospel itself is enticing enough for people. Amen. You don't have to put a bunch of makeup on it. Let it be what it is. It's good news as it is. You can't improve on the, the perfect news of the gospel. Amen. But it's going to happen with you in your place. And when you're in your place doing the thing that God called you to do, you'll have not only prosperity and fulfillment. Yes, absolutely you will. But you will have influence and impact. I don't want to live a life void of impact. Who does? <laughs> you know what, I, man, you know what I really want in life? Nothing. Nothing. I hope no one remembers me. I hope I do nothing significant. I hope I'm a complete failure and a complete loser for the rest of my life. No one wants this. Nobody wants that. But the only way to get to the place where you're having impact, man, this should excite you a whole lot more than what it is right now, where you're having impact on your city, your community, your family, Your nation is when you're in your place fulfilling the call of God on your life. That's going to be your happy place. That's your happy place. Is the place that he's called you to be in. And be determined now. Just start right now. Be determined right now. Make the conscious decision in your heart that I am not going to be afraid of the future. I'm going to let go of failures of the past and I'm not going to allow my feelings of the present to hold me back from what the Lord wants me to do. I'm not going to do it. And we could sit here and I could try to sell you on it. That's not what I'm, what I'm here to do. I'm not a salesman. No preacher should be a salesman. This is good news, man. But if you want it, it's going to take faith. It's going to take faith. That doesn't mean that you're never going to have battles. And a lot of faith people need to understand that. That faith doesn't mean that you're not going to have battles. That you're not going to deal with stuff. You will. Jesus said that. Jesus said that, you know, don't be deceived. Perilous times are coming. What does that mean? Exactly what he said. They're coming. But he said, don't be afraid. When they do come. Amen. When they do come, don't be afraid because I have overcome the world for you. And that's the good news. So even in your place, fulfilling your God-given grace and call in your life, you will experience opposition and obstacles. You will. And that's okay. Because you're with the one who overcome those obstacles. Greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. And you have a calling. You have an anointing. You have a grace on your life. Just like you have a God-given place, you have a God-given grace. It's an anointing. It's a call. It's something that God has equipped you and empowered you to do. Amen. And don't, don't allow that to be hidden forever. Allow that to come out. Jesus said that, was it Mark chapter 4? verse 20 something, where he says, we don't have a lamp. We don't light a lamp and then put it under the bed. We don't put it under the basket. The lamp is supposed to be on the table to shine a light in the darkness. That's exactly what your calling 
can do in your sphere of influence. That God will put you in a place, giving you a grace to do something, to shine a light in the darkness around people. And so don't take that and say, well, I don't want anybody to see that. And you throw it out, you hide it. No, allow that to come forth, man. Be bold about what God's called you to do. Be bold about the grace that's on your life. And the Apostle Paul said, I magnify the gift. I magnify the gift and the call of God on my life. That doesn't belittle anybody else. We don't, you don't have to magnify your own by tearing somebody else down. Uh, Dad Hagen who used to say that blowing out someone else's candle never brightens yours. We don't have to do that. All right? And it's not a competition and it's not comparison. Well, if, if so-and-so gets ahead, then that means I won't. As if there's not enough favor for you and me. Exactly. This is ridiculous. Yeah. And so we're not in competition. We're not in comparison with anybody. But magnify the gift of God that he's put in you. There is a gift in there. Don't allow the enemy or just your natural reasoning to belittle it and say, well, that's not as important as theirs. I wish I had that. Man, that'd be, that'd be great, wouldn't it? You could be thankful for what other people have in the gift of God in their life, but also don't belittle your own and treat it as worthless because it's not. There's a place for everybody in the body of Christ. It's just like, you know, we've talked about this before. We always want to talk about being the hands and feet of Jesus. Oh, that's so great. We want to be the hands and feet of Jesus. The hands mean nothing without the wrist, without the forearm, without the elbow. Without the sh- There's so many things that have to take place for the hand to even be useful. Right. You don't believe me? Break your elbow. <laughs> See how useful that wrist is after that. Now, nobody break your elbow and then come sue Jonathan. I'm not telling you to actually break your elbow, but I'm trying to prove a point. The wrist, the the hand is nothing without the things that are leading up to it. Amen. So don't belittle yourself because you're a forearm and not a hand. Still important. It helps extend that hand so that it can fulfill its purpose. And everybody in their place operating and flowing in their grace, I mean, that's when we're going to get some stuff done for the kingdom of God. Amen? Let's stand up on our feet.